The word that stood out to me in both the second verse of Hail to the Lord Anointed, which is on the front of your bulletin, and uh, the Isaiah reading was the word sighing. Sighing. <sighs> you know, when I announce and say, we're changing the 915 service to 9, and I say, what will we, when will you come on December 28th? And somebody says, 915, what can I do but go, <sighs> <sighs> Bear me this. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself just sighing? I mean, you just sigh. And you're, I don't even know if you're aware of it. You just, you just, um, sighing might be the true revelation of who we are. It might be authentically what's going on in our life. It's hard to hide sighing. You know, it, it's almost like that, you know, a body gesture that you just can't stop. <sighs> yeah, oh, he's preaching again. <sighs> They're singing that song again. <sighs> How many people in Wisconsin stands last night do you think we're going? <sighs> 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 yeah. There's just that sign. And sign, you know, there are different kinds of sign. There, there are sighs of relief, you know. Whew, dodge that bullet. Uh, there are sighs, there are probably sighs of victory, but it's, it's hard to think about them. There are sighs of frustration, there are sighs of exasperation. I get a kick now out of listening to sports and uh, political talk shows where somebody will call in and just make a knuckleheaded statement and the host will begin by going, <sighs> and like, spare me this fool, you know. Oh, you know, I can't believe I've got these knuckleheads around me. Sign for me, I, I, I've been paying attention to my sign this week and how frequently I do it. Um, sign for me uh, has to do, revolve around the word precious. You know, and the last phrase of, of, of that verse from Hail to the Lord's Anointed is, for they are precious in his sight. Well, one cause of my sign is I don't feel precious all the time. And I sigh over that. <sighs> I can't believe I said that. <sighs> I can't believe I did that. <sighs> what a fool. What a fool. <sighs> you know, and then, you know, I often also feel unprecious. And I'm not talking about precious in the sense of, you know, um, Golem in, in uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, my precious, say it, Colleen, say it. <laughs> you know, I mean, precious is um, uniquely cherished, treasured, valuable. You know, my children are precious to me. You know, they're, they're unique. And, and so, and, and sometimes I also, I don't feel precious because I don't feel loved. I don't feel unique. I feel unwanted. Uh, I, I, I feel unvalued. And the, other, the other part of precious uh, that causes me to sigh is other people. Because sometimes other people are not precious in my sight, you know. Uh, I'm not going to answer that call. I'm not going to answer that call. I just don't have the time to talk right now. You know, oh, they're here. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Not precious. We sigh for a variety of reasons. But one of the things, so what are we sighing for? I think we're sighing, um, we're sighing for a sense of wholeness when we feel broken. We're sighing for a sense of, of healing when we're in pain or suffering. Uh, we're signed for a sense of being precious when we don't feel precious. Uh, we're signed, I think, chiefly for a sense of home. We want to feel at home. And, and, you know, the idea of home covers a multitude of things. And again, I, I know homes can be broken and I know homes can be abusive. But even when we're in broken and abusive homes, we're signed for the ideal home where we are included and we are loved and we are considered precious. In Isaiah 35, the Jews are sighing 
for home. For the last 50 years in this text, they've been living in Babylon. They've been strangers in a strange land. Jerusalem has been leveled. It's been destroyed. Massive defeat. Uh, the people are taken in exile across the desert through Syria uh, in, into what is now Iran. And, and, and it is a desert and people died from thirst. They died from hunger on this journey. They were attacked by wild animals, by jackals. This was a hellish time in their lives. And when they were in Babylon, they were strangers in a strange land. And you can read some of the Psalms where they're mocked and made fun of. They had no sense of home. They had no sense of being precious. And they were sighing. They were empty. They were broken. They were defeated. And they're sighing for home. And Isaiah comes along and says, the time is up. You're going to go home. And don't sigh about that desert because the desert has been changed into a, into a, a garden. There are flowers in it now. Don't sigh about lack of water because there's going to be water. The, 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 the sand has become water. Don't sigh about the, 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 uh, the jackals because they've been done away with. You're going home. You know, it's a wonderful scene. You know, exchange your sign for songs of joy. Yeah. Now, in order for them to go home, there's one thing they've got to do. There's one thing they've got to do. They've got to get up and go. You know, I could say, there's a pot of gold at the corner of King and Pennsylvania. And it could be true. But one thing you've got to do is get up and go to get there. And in the middle of all this stuff, Isaiah addresses the issue of don't be afraid. Strengthen the firm hand. Make firm the feeble knee. Get moving. And the response is, I'm afraid. I'm paralyzed. I can't do it. I can't go back to that desert. I can't go back to the, to the death march. And Isaiah says those phrases. They're imperatives. And I've always thought those phase, pra phrases were addressed to the individual. Were addressed to the individual. John, get up. John, strengthen your hands. And that might very well be true, but I think there's a second meaning in this. I think the second meaning is, John, your neighbor can't get going. Your neighbor is afraid. Your neighbor can't move her knees and can't lift her hands. John, you help overcome her fear. John, you help strengthen her knees. John, you strengthen her hands. You help her get moving. It becomes a community thing. We're all going home. And we're going to help each other get home. And we're going to help each other feel precious. We're going to help each other. Brian McLaren has written a book on what is unique about each Christian denomination. And it's a really interesting book. And, and his chapter on Methodism is the shortest in the book. Uh, there's not a lot to say about Methodists. And actually, he reduces the chapter on Methodism to one picture. And it's the picture of three people climbing a hill. And their hands are linked. And person A is helping person B. And person B is helping person C. And McLaren says, that's what Methodism is. People helping each other. And I thought, what a great image. You know, we help each other ascend the hill. We help each other go home. Now, Isaiah, when he says, do this, he doesn't say, help that person because they're precious. He just says, do it. Just do it. Now, I think what happens, however, when we uh, do help that person get home is we overcome our blindness. We start to see them 
as they are. We exchange our blindness for seeing. And we start to hear what they're saying. And so our deafness is taken away. And it's replaced with hearing. And we start to maybe become their advocate and speak for them. And our inability to talk is taken away. And we speak. And we do start to see that person as precious in our sight. And precious in God's sight. I've said it several times. Every Saturday morning I walk in the short north at 6.30. And um, it's pretty deserted then. And, and uh, last Saturday I, as I was walking south on High Street, I, uh, I passed a young woman who had a backpack. And I, I passed her and we looked at each other and we both said hi and moved on. And, and uh, she went north, I went south. I got to the Hyde Park uh, restaurant, turned around and started walking north on High Street toward Kroger. And got to a bus stop and there she was at the bus stop again. And I said hi, and she said hi, and she said, do you have a dime? And I said, no I don't. I had a 20, but I didn't have a dime. And I was going to buy, stop at Kroger up here uh, to, to, to buy my oranges and bananas because my doctor believes in potassium and roughage. And I and, was um, going to buy some other stuff, you know. So I, I stopped at Kroger and, and, and bought this stuff and was walking out with my, my tote bag. And uh, there she was coming into the parking lot again. She was coming into the parking lot. And I thought, I've got change. I've got 27 cents. So she walked toward me and I walked toward her and I said, I've got your money. I've got 27 cents. And she said, God bless you. God bless you. You remembered me. And I think she was saying, I'm precious in your sight. Thank you for remembering me. And then she hugged me and kissed me right in the middle of the parking lot at Kroger's. <laughs> you know, she kissed me. And she said, God bless you. And I said, well, God bless you too. And you know, as I continued down King Avenue toward home, I thought, I don't know if I'd know her if I saw her again. I don't know if she'd know me, if she saw me again. But I know for that 15 second exchange, we had become precious in each other's sight. And we had helped each other and I felt firmly that God is here in that exchange in the parking lot. And you know, I walked home a little faster and a little lighter and with a little more energy. You know, God is here. This passage is about really exchanges. It's about transition. We exchange our blindness toward others to seeing. We exchange our deafness toward others to hearing. We exchange our refusal to advocate to speaking for others. And we exchange our lack of movement toward others to movement. And, and the, you know, the desert becomes a place of life. And, it, and it's not a place of fear anymore because God is here and we exchange our sign for songs, for songs. You don't come here to listen to the blender's sigh. <laughs> you come here to hear them sing. <laughs> yeah. You know, we come for that exchange because we want, you know, God is here and we want to feel precious. Sign can also be seen as a transition. We sigh to prepare ourselves for something else. It's kind of a self-emptying. We're kind of getting the garbage out. So we can be filled with energy and life. So we can be filled with God. God is here. You know, Paul says that prayer is actually just sign. 
It's God filling us and meeting our size. And we replace the sign with song. It's a transition where the person on the street becomes precious. Where the person sitting next to us becomes precious. Where, where the baby in a manger is precious. Where the family in a barn is precious. God is here. We are precious. May it be so. Amen.